Well, we were almost 115. Mr. Varner was getting us to that, so thank you, sir. Um, so we're going to go right to public participation. Um, and Mertz, please. And then we'll go back to the morning session. So I, I guess I had to do this. Good afternoon. The time is now 1.20 and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Ed meeting of 2010, 2010 of September 10, 2013 is called to order. I have one public participation form, and that's Don Pata. If you could come to the end of the table, please. The network is committed to being here every meeting. Thank you. There's five minutes for public participation, and I'll just remind um, Mr. Pata and as well as everyone else that the board does not um, engage in conversation at the board table, um, but are happy to hear your presentation. <coughs> So whenever you're ready, we're ready. We got no one. Excuse me, we're just. They're in a meeting. I just thought we were abandoned by our troops here. I don't see anyone on the. Wait, no, it's uh, all right. Excuse us. <laughs> well, there's only one public comment today, so. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> Thanks so much. Hi, my name is Don Pata, and I am here representing the Network of Michigan Educators today. The network is a group of award-winning teachers um, from all over the state of Michigan. We're trying to spread the good word um, that we do as educators in Michigan all the time. I'm also here representing uh, Gross Point Public Schools today. I teach at Gross Point North High School, and you may have heard something about Gross Point North High School recently. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's interesting that I'm here. I'm not here with Gary, although uh, Gary and I are colleagues, and I'll call him out a little bit. Um, I've been at North for a little longer than Gary, and he's actually a former student of mine. Um, not that not that my outstanding pedagogy has you know caused any success, but I'd like to think that maybe maybe a little bit um, rubbed off along the way. So I've been teaching for about 15 years, and I teach with a um, fully constructivist inquiry-based um, methodology. I teach physics called the modeling method, and it's very successful for me and everyone else that I know that does it because it's very kid-centered as, as a whole concept that's where it's at. I started teaching about 15 years ago and was very naive. Um, pretty much had no idea what I was doing for the first couple years but you don't know that you don't know until someone calls and says hey listen my mentor teacher uh, from down the road called and said I'm teaching this workshop over the summer why don't you come? And I said oh that's great so let's like, go take this workshop and it was a revelation. It changed my life because I had a good sense of teaching and learning but didn't know how to do it. <coughs> But I took this workshop to learn this, this modeling method, how to really reach kids and make it kid-centered. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh my gosh, I can now teach the way I've always wanted to teach. <laughs> and from then on, it's just I've just put the pedal to the metal, and I've just been cruising. So let's talk about my classroom real quick, because um, you know I got five minutes. Let's make it about me real fast. So I got a, <laughs> if you look at like a three-day inquiry cycle of my classroom, the kids get a physical situation. Um, they start asking questions about it. What can we do? What can we measure? Then they design their own experiments, and they do the measuring. And then I say, okay, that's really great, and what are you going to do with it? And so they're like, okay, this is what we think it is. And they analyze their data, and they represent it on these two-foot by three-foot dry erase whiteboards. And I get to sit back and you know check for understanding and ask cool questions. We call it Socratic dialogue, right? And then everyone they finish their whiteboards. We get in this big circle in my classroom. It's 30 kids in a circle, and they all have their you know their group whiteboards in front of them, and they're asking questions to each other. And the kids have to represent and then defend all their data and their conclusions. The best part about this is that in my classroom, inquiry is not something you do occasionally. It's a way of life. That's just how we do it. And it's so fun for the kids because this inquiry method, this modeling method that we use was developed at Arizona State um, in the mid-90s. And it's so kid-centered that they take to it like a fish in water. And so all of a sudden, it's, it's ingrained as to how they learn. And they just run with it. And it's just fun. It's fun for everybody. And that's why I love going to school every day. Once they do that, all of a sudden, it opens them up for everything else. We now do project-based learning in the classroom. Some people struggle with project-based learning because they're like, well, how do we get the kids to do it? 
that's not a problem for us because the whole class is kid-centered. So I'm like, here, listen, build a spaghetti bridge. No problem. Build a mousetrap car. Build a marshmallow catapult. Not that these things are unique to my classroom or our school, but the kids go for it with this reckless abandon where they can express their creativity. And that's what I love the most. It all culminates with this cardboard boat race. I would love to take some credit for it, but Gary brought it to us. He's like, let's have kids build two-man cardboard boats and race them in the pool. I'm like, I'm sorry, what are we going to do? And he said, let's just do it. And we did. And now it's become like a school event. It's changed the culture of the school. And it's, it's amazing. I, uh, when Superintendent Flanagan was at the school last year to prevent Gary, uh, present Gary with the award, he visited some classrooms and saw this infectious creativity that we have at the school. And he says, how do we take it to more schools? I'm lucky enough to teach a class, the same workshop that I took that changed my life for other physics teachers in the summer. And it has also been really great for me to learn and work with other teachers. And I've changed some other teachers' lives through this. And they tell me, I heard one the other day that says, I was planning on retiring, 25 year veteran. I was planning on retiring in five years. He says, now I'm teaching for another 10 because this is gonna be so fun for my kids. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask for something in my quick time, and I want to say that we need the ne next generation science standards, the <coughs> NGSS. This is going to push teachers um, toward more inquiry, and it's going to allow us to teach the way that we've always wanted to teach. So thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Would Einstein say that this five-minute time thing is real, or how does that? <laughs> well, you know, our perception of it may be real. <laughs> <Our perception. laughs> That's all well, it is. Are Thank you for giving you the thanks, Don. Are Thank there you. any more public participation forms? Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Gave us a boost for the afternoon. Thank you. That was a nice. <laughs> We're going to uh, go and we're going to introduce, we're lucky to have some new team members at MDE and we're going to move right to that and then you're, you are genuinely welcome to stay the rest of the meeting if you'd like it or not, but we want to at least give you that option if you felt because that you needed to get back. Taking the work home. So who's starting that from our <laughs> deputy oh, group? I will. Susan, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I work in the Child Provider Enrollment Unit, so um, it's for people that are unlicensed uh, daycare providers for children, and we work at um, screening them to make sure that the child is in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. And I've been with the state since 1999 in the Department of Treasury, Department of Community Health, Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, and now Education. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm here for Carol Wallenberg, who's not um, here, she's over in Italy right now, but I have the privilege to uh, introduce Matt Kaser, who's in the Library of Michigan. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about yourself, that'd be great. Hello, my name's Matt Kaser, I work uh, in the Library of Michigan, I'm a reference librarian, and I assist uh, state employees with reverence and research requests, and uh, as necessary, I'll be helping with outreach and training with uh, state employees on our uh, collections and services. And before here, I worked at the Capital Area District Libraries right down the road at the uh, downtown branch. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, from Ed Services, we have Kenyelle Ferguson from the School Reform Office. If you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself, that would be excellent as well. Um, good afternoon. I work in the um, School Reform Office, um, particularly with the Critical Friends Work Group where um, I'm designing the Facebook page and doing a little bit of research um, according to like, um, best practices and schools that are um, selling. Um, I've been at the MDE for about a month now. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Carrie Noyes was also able to join us at the last minute, so I think. That's okay. Um, I work in the Office of Special Education. My name is Terry Noyes, and I'm a consultant with the Program <coughs> Accountability Unit. And specifically, I am a complaint investigator, and I also answer the telephone for the Special Education Information Desk from the community. And I've worked here for only a month, so I'm really enjoying it. Let's welcome the whole team <laughs> to our. <laughs> and by the way, can I refer my wife to the complaint administrator? Is this a way to. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dan. That was how did you be. know it's good for you? You're listening, honey. I, I'm just kidding, honey. If you're watching, <laughs> she does in a very odd way watch this periodically. Uh, well, this is uh, boy timely. Our next item. We're going back to the morning. It's item C. It's a presentation of the Michigan Council of Educator Effectiveness, and I think Dean Ball is presenting tomorrow to uh, Senator Pavlov's committee. And uh, Joseph, as you know, has been our point person on that. Even though I saw a presentation briefly, I was with the Ed Alliance for a little bit yesterday, and they had uh, Jennifer Hammond there, who did a great job, and at least the part I stood in or sat in on in trying to brief some of them. Um, and gave high praise to Joseph, even though he was listed as a non-voting member, but that he had a lot of influence. So with that, uh, your request was that he give us some uh, a summary of that. Uh, as you know, the, the law required, and appropriately so, that this report be made available to the board. <clears throat> but it's one thing to be made available. It's another thing to understand elements of it. So that's the intent for this item today. Thank you. So... Uh, we've entitled this one, Unpacking the MCE Recommendations. Um, just a little bit about this presentation. This is a factual summary of the recommendations of the Michigan Council for Educator Effectiveness as included in its report. It is not an exhaustive review of the MCE recommendations, otherwise I'd just read that. So. Um, and it is, it is not a description of future requirements. They, uh, just to be clear, these are recommendations only at this point. They still have to be uh, deliberated upon and put into legislation. So the MCE vision was to develop a fair, transparent, and feasible evaluation system for teachers and school administrators. That's a high task. The system is to be based on rigorous standards of professional practice and of measurement. The goals of the system are to contribute to enhanced instruction improving st student achievement and support ongoing professional learning. So I thought it was, you know, I just read that off the screen. I don't typically do that when I give a presentation, but I think that's an important piece of what, what this group did, was really to make this a, an improvement-focused system that is fair, transparent, and feasible. Those are, those are really um, the guiding principles by which the, uh, the committee did its work. So some of the big ideas from the report are a significant a recommendation for a significant change in the timelines. So the timeline as it currently stands in legislation is that the statewide system is supposed to go into effect this school year. Um, the timeline recommended by the MCEE is that we have legislation and RFP or contract development happening this year that next year it be systems guidelines and training development so that um, we actually have some time to make sure that the systems are done well and uh, of course as you know legislation and RFP contract development takes time um, this is still an aggressive timeline um, then systems guideline and training development after we have contractors in place that also takes time and this is still an aggressive timeline and for the 2015-16 school year is implementation of the new statewide system uh, big ideas continued uh, to continue the existing local systems until that uh, initial implementation year and again an emphasis on feedback and improvement where training is key feedback is very important in being able to provide information about where people need to improve even those who are rated as professional and and <coughs> also that results be protected from disclosure so that this remains an improvement focused system <coughs> So some recommendations regarding teacher evaluation. Teacher evaluation, as recommended, is to be um, based 50% upon professional practice and 50% upon student growth or value-added modeling. And the acronym for that is VAM, and I'll probably use that from here on. So um, based on that overall evaluation, the recommendations are that there be three categories rather than the four that were previously um, in, in statute and that if a teacher is rec is rated as professional at the end of the year that if that happens three years in a row that teacher would be eligible for an advanced role and if they have three in a row they would also not be um, required to have an evaluation every year but could have that happen every other year provisional 
if a teacher is identified as provisional, they, for three consecutive years, they would be counseled out of the role within the district, but may be placed in a different role within the district. And if there are two consecutive years of ineffective ratings, they would be, the recommendation is that they would be terminated from their role in the LEA. Um, but that, again, is just in, in, the, in, in that given LEA. A little bit of background about why it went from four to three. It was pretty clear that there are at least two categories that needed to be identified. Those that urgently need assistance, urgently need improvement, those that are at risk of falling into that category, and then the remainder. Um, so based on those needs that were identified by the MCE, that is why we got to the three recommended categories rather than four. So talking about the professional practice portion of the overall evaluation, we are looking at a recommendation of 40 to 50 percent of that coming from classroom observations and zero to 10 percent of that coming from other data. Whether or not a district uses data beyond the classroom observations would be up to the district. So for the classroom observation portion, the recommendation is, is that the state issue an RFP for an observation system, a teacher observation system, and that may be bid on by the four vendor systems that were piloted under the MCEE pilot, and the, the state is to award a contract to only one vendor and then to pay for training and system use on behalf of districts. The other data could come from many different sources. For example, student surveys, parent surveys, portfolios, um, and that really is up to, the, up, up to the local district whether or not they use other data and what kinds of data they would use there. On the student growth or value added side, we would be looking at value added from required state assessments either being 0% or between 25 and 50%. Okay, why that? The issue there is that it would be required to be at least 25% for teachers who were responsible for student growth in grades and subjects where growth data are available from mandated state assessments. That would be for individual teachers grades 4 through 8 reading and math currently. That may be expanded in the future, but currently that's where that lies. For, it, and a district could opt to have that um, comprise the full 50% that is based on student growth. Um, but it's not applicable for teachers who are not responsible for student growth in grades and subjects where growth data are not available. And the recommendation is that the state issue an RFP are requests for proposals for, a, for VAM services and to provide the VAM measures back to districts. That would also uh, require some modifications to state systems to make sure that we capture all the appropriate data to appropriately attribute an appeal for students to be removed fr fr from a specific teacher's uh, VAM scores and so on. The VAM from op optional state assessments would be applicable for teachers teaching in core subjects and grades where the district adopts optional state provided assessments which we are developing at this point so science and social studies k2 english language arts and math the credit content assessments for the michigan merit credits and so on and that could comprise between zero and fifty percent of the evaluation uh, depending on district um, desires then there's building VAM from required state assessments and that could be between zero and five percent of the overall evaluation. So it is possible to create VAM scores for a teacher and VAM scores for a building and VAM scores for a whole district. You can do that in a lot of different ways. And allowing for building VAM scores to be applied directly to individual teachers overall evaluation encourages teamwork. That was kind of the rationale behind that, but it's limited to a very small percentage to assure that the vast majority of the growth measure actually comes from teachers that the from students, the te growth of the students the teacher is directly teaching. So it allows for kind of this, okay, let's go ahead and set a, a building-wide goal, but make sure that the vast majority comes from the students that the teacher is directly responsible for. And then there are other measures of student growth, and these again could be between 0 and 50 percent, depending on district discretion. And those could include non-VAM measures of student growth from state-provided assessments. So we provide a measure of growth that is not necessarily value-added, but it is a measure of student growth. VAM or non-VAM measures from, of student growth from district-purchased or vendor-provided assessments. 
<coughs> and measures of student growth from locally developed assessments and locally developed student learning objectives. And, and one of the interesting things about the student learning objectives is that the council felt like that was a really important part of this. Making this available is a really important part of this because it allows individual educators to get become more invested in monitoring, setting goals for, um, kind of unpacking the growth that individual students are, are um, uh, achieving over time. And it, could, it also is a, you know, actually learning how to develop good student learning objectives, learning how to measure them, is, can also be very good professional development. <coughs> yes? Um, so if I have a French teacher, high school French teacher, uh, we'd use another measure of student growth for, uh, to assess the student growth. Uh, maybe 5%, but where does the other 45% uh, come from in, in a case like that? Okay, so, and, and this, is, this is where things get a little bit tricky because, okay. uh, of course, we don't have state-mandated growth data for every teacher, right? Right. So, this other measures of student growth could be 0 to 50%. All right. So, if you have a student, learn, if you end up setting up student learning objectives for those French students or you're able to purchase a a French assessment from, from a vendor, you could use that for the full 50% or you could use some kind of mix of all of these to comprise the full 50% that is based on student growth. That I understand, but where does the other 50% come in? Observations. On pr the professional practice part is the other 50%. Oh, so this 50% is the identical with the 50% of student growth as opposed right, to right. the, okay, I was thinking it was half of the student growth score yeah so okay apparently the printouts didn't do an adequate job of, uh, of recreating the shadows that I put from, from one to the other so my apologies for that so here's so, an example yes just to just clarify so in other words what adds up from the uh, four boxes will add up to 50 percent not 100 percent that's correct thank you okay. yes thank you for the clarification so then comes the difficult task of combining the professional practice metrics with the student growth metrics. Um, those are two hopefully strongly related things, but they are separate things. And you would not necessarily just want to put them on one big scale because mixing them together it kind of assumes that they're the same thing. These really are different things. So one of the ways that um, someone could do this, and this is not to say this is the recommendation for how it would happen in every district, district, but this is an example of how it could happen. You could divide up the professional practice into three categories. You could divide up the student growth um, metric into three categories, and then create some kind of table where you say, okay, um, if they are professional on professional practice and they meet expectations with student growth, we're going to call that overall label, that overall evaluation professional. So, and so on and so forth. You would look at where they lie on both sides of that and, and come to a, an overall recommendation for whether or not that individual educator is rated as professional, provisional, or ineffective. So on administrator evaluation, you have a very similar piece. The only difference here is that uh, if you're rated professional for three consecutive years, you're already in a leadership position. So. Um, that's not, not something that uh, necessarily would come with that, that additional three years. Again, the professional practice side is, again, 50%. And the big difference here is <coughs> it's not classroom observation that's going on with principals and central office staff and, and superintendents. It's their leadership, some kind of evaluation of their leadership role over, over individual educators, over other administrators. So um, wh what is recommended here is the use of a professional leadership evaluation tool, not necessarily a classroom observation tool, as well as possibly other data. And the, the, MCE, rec the MCE recommendations are silent on how much comes from each one of those. So all we know is that the professional practice piece has to add up to 50%. So you have to have at least both of those in there somewhere, but how much you weight each one of those is, is really at the district discretion. So on the professional leadership evaluation tool, again, the state's to issue an RFP for one of those that, the two vendors that were listed in the report, 
And just to give a little background on why the four vendors, uh, going back to educator or teacher evaluations, the four vendors were selected, it was based on um, vendors that had adequate data regarding reliability and validity. So there were four that had adequate reliability and validity. They were piloted to see if they could kind of scale up quickly, and they, they seemed to have done reasonably well. For the professional leadership evaluation tool, this is really new. There's not a lot of research out on this one. So what they looked at was more th things along the lines of what systems, in the absence of good research on them, would give good feedback to evaluators, have the, have the strong potential of giving good feedback to, to principals, superintendents, and so on. Um, and the issue is, so the intent of the recommendations is for the state to award a, a, a contract to just one and then pay for that on behalf of districts, and then to study it to make sure that we gather a adequate evidence. And the other data, the law indicates that that must include proficiency in conducting evaluations, progress made on the school improvement plan, attendance rates, and student parent and teacher feedback. It can also include additional things such as professional contributions, peer input, and so on. On the, fifth, on the growth side, and again, thank you, Richard, for um, indicating that all of these here add up to the 50% for student growth. Um, we would have value-added models from required state assessments, and this would be required to be at least 25% for administrators responsible for student growth in grades and subjects where growth data are available from mandated state assessments. And there's a little bit of a difference here with um, what's available for individual teachers. Uh, again, for individual teachers, we measure students only uh, in subsequent, in consecutive years, only from grades 3 to 8, meaning that there's growth data available from 4 to 8, English, language, arts, and math. Actually, for individual administrators, that may be, you may be able to apply that in high school because you get, an, you get an, an assessment just before high school, then you get an assessment in 11th grade, and all of those things could be looked at. Okay, how much growth was observed from beginning of high school until the Michigan Merit Exam? So you could have more applicability for administrators on this. It could be up to 50% for administrators for whom it's applicable, and the state is again to issue that RFP. Same thing for optional state assessments. Um, districts could opt with those additional state assessments to adopt those and then use those in, in the administrator evaluations. And then again, the same sets of measures of other measures of student growth would be available to be used in administrator evaluations at district discretion. Very similar here. I'm not going to go through the whole thing again. It's just the same kind of um, coming to a conclusion from the two metrics. And then there are some recommendations about teacher certification, how one moves from provisional to professional teacher certification. So teachers wishing to move from provisional to professional certificate must receive a professional rating for three successive years immediately prior to applying for the professional cert certificate, with an exception. If they don't, and they've received at least three three professional ratings even though they may not be consecutive and they have their administrator's recommendation they might they may be moved to professional and teachers not meeting the requirements for advancement to a professional a professional certificate may continue to review renew their provisional certifications again and again then waivers one of the interesting things that um, the original law indicated was that a district needed to um, declare itself exempt by indicating that it was uh, complying with the requirements of the law as specified to use observations and growth and so on before the MCE began its work. And that was the only requirement. They just had to declare themselves exempt. The recommendation of the MCEE was that um, if we receive waivers, and we were, we were supposed to actually come up with a recommendation for how to deal with waivers, um, that those districts that are requesting a wa waiver must demonstrate that their systems and processes have the same level of quality and rigor and so on. And if an LEA submits an adapted form, they have to show that they're not doing damage to the reliability and validity. And if a, an LEA is using an evaluation system that's really new, they have to commit to and provide a plan for gathering that kind of data about it. Um, and the MCE also recommended that any of that um, declared themselves exempt would have to go through the waiver review process as well just to make sure that we have adequate quality and rigor in those as well. 
So next steps and I, our ideal timeline, as I said at the very outset, this is pretty aggressive. So we're talking about <laughs> legislative action, digesting legislative requirements, issuing requests for proposals, evaluating bids and uh, proposals and bids, and awarding contracts in the next year. That's aggressive. Then 2014-15, doing requirements getting, gathering, building and modifying systems, developing training, designing guidelines. That's also pretty aggressive to do in a, in a single year. And then 2015-16, implementation. So, um, questions, comments, and we'll try to stick to the ask one and let it go around <laughs> table and you can come back to your second question. Yes, ma'am. I just have one question, and it might be really loaded, but um, <laughs> I hear a lot, the word assessment a lot in this, and more assessment. Is this going to lead to a lot more testing in our schools? So that's, it, it is likely to lead to more assessment of individual students to measure their progress. It's not likely to lead to more mandated assessment. So that was very, that was very carefully indicated in the, in the, in the report, is that, um, Again, the state mandated assessment, and it actually, the, one of the recommendations in the report is that state mandated assessment not be expanded. Okay. So that the mandated assessment remains the same. That means that when we develop these additional assessments, they're optional. Um, we would be providing an, a, a service to local districts because we would be providing something for them at state cost if the recommendations are carried out that they would otherwise have to pay for, for them, pay for themselves. So it would be kind of a, a significant incentive for them to adopt, but not mandated. And, um, and, and it does go back to um, Dr. Ziley's comments previously about sometimes it's, it's more important. It, 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 the, the issue is not waiting until the very end to find out that your student is not going to be proficient. It's about tracking that over time, making sure that you understand over time so it's not a gotcha at the end. You really have a sense of what that trajectory is and what you need to do over time to make sure that kids are going to be where they need to be. And another important thing to re remember is that um, it's about growth. And, and, and that's, that's a really important piece of this, is that we are able to see wherever students are, that students are able to obtain that growth regardless of background, regardless of demographics. And I think that's a, a really important piece of this that we need to make sure we, we recognize. Other comments, questions for Joseph? Kathleen, please. How reliable are the <coughs> assessment, evaluated <coughs> tests? Um, we're basing a lot on value added. Yeah. And there's been a lot of criticism of those results. And how reliable yeah. do you think they are? And are we going to be able to do this? So there are, there are a lot of scholarly disagreements about how reliable value added is. One of the things that is clear is that when you're measuring growth, it is less reliable than measuring status. But it's also very important to, to measure growth instead because that is so much less affected by demographics and background. So it's kind of one of those things where you would say that it is going to move us in a better direction to go with growth, which is essentially value-added measures, essentially contribution to student achievement through growth. Um, and it, it's kind of, because it's not perfect, it doesn't mean we don't use it. And that's one of the reasons that it's, that it's downweighted as much as it is, where it says, okay, only 25% <coughs> based on state mandated <coughs> assessment. If a district wants to go above that, they can. But the mandate is, is, is reasonably low. And um, that's also one of the reasons that we, we, can, we include a lot of other things, such as the observation, the other data, and the student learning objectives, and so on. But yes, there are some concerns, and the, the MCE did deal directly with those concerns and looked at, okay, how do we come up with recommendations that say, you know, this is a valuable tool, but not weight it so heavily that you can't, you, that you can't deal with additional information. And a follow-up question, if I may. Where, how, where is Michigan? How good are we at the value-added tests? Uh, at value-added modeling? Yeah. Um, we are reasonably sophisticated compared to most states in terms of our internal state staff. Um, actually, quite sophisticated compared to most states with, <laughs> our, internal states, with our internal state have staff. You, I know that. Well, I was actually not referring to me. I was referring to my staff, <laughs> but yeah. thank you. Um, but um, we would likely put that out for a bid rather than running it ourselves. 
because um, you know being able to people who have been doing this for quite some time have a lot more um, a lot more sense of the pitfalls that you can run into, not just the knowledge of how do you do it. So having someone who's done this in multiple places and understands it from the operational perspective, I think, is important. We still had a ring like that. That was a very sophisticated answer. Thank you. <laughs> Gary, I think you were next. And yes. then Michelle. And then Dan. So, Joseph, I, I've read over some of the report myself, and I've, I've heard many of the same things in, in your report today, so thank you for those points. Could you talk a little bit about if there were any recommendations, I haven't seen them, as to how they recommend teachers are supported between classroom observations and based on the feedback that they receive from their evaluations. Right, so the recommendations are that, so it, it's clear in the recommendations that based on observations, teachers are supposed to receive feedback from the person who did the observations and the principal evaluator is kind of the language that's used. Mm -hmm. So it's clear that that feedback is supposed to happen. Um, it doesn't give a lot of specificity on how that feedback is supposed to happen. Um, one of the things that is also clear in the recommendations is that the state would issue an RFP for training. So that specifically training on giving feedback, coaching, conducting the observations, conducting an overall evaluation session where you combine the growth with the observations into an overall evaluation so that there would be a lot of training for the evaluator so they know how to provide that kind of feedback to teachers and that they know how to um, integrate this into an overall quality evaluation. But then there are no specific or explicit rather recommendations about even beyond the feedback. I guess my, my question really deals more with once that feedback is given, mm -hmm what are the actionable steps that happen before that next evaluation? Right, so the, the recommendations, my recollection is that recommendation is there, that, um, that educators be given specific professional learning opportunities to address any identified weaknesses or any places where they could get better. And again, one of the things, uh, going back to three versus four categories. One of the reasons that that fourth category was not recommended, the advanced category, was to avoid giving the sense that someone's done. Yes. <laughs> that anyone's done. Yeah. And that everyone can improve. And, and so that it's not just identifying weak teachers who need a lot of work. It's identifying where you can get better for strong teachers. It's everyone needs to get that feedback and needs to get that targeted professional learning. So my recollection is that is in there, but I will check and make sure that we get back to you. Okay. Yeah, that, that's the one thing that I was, when I kind of scanned through it, I didn't see anything, and it's still, to me, that's not really that much better than what we're already using on a, on a per-district basis. And I wondered the same question now is when I get feedback from my administrator, they tell me what I could do better and some areas to consider, and they might even give me a couple of actionable steps, but then I don't see them for some time until my next evaluation. And having that support for teachers is, I think, really what's missing to make an evaluation model really improvement-based rather than evaluative or punitive. Right. And I, I guess I'm still missing how this, although it claims to be improvement-focused, is supporting teachers in improvement. So I will, I will read through again specifically for that and get back to you on that. And if it's not there, I think that's something we can certainly carry forward to the legislature. I, right. I, my recollection from the conversations is that was the intent. Absolutely. So, Thank you. And I noticed that Jennifer yesterday felt comfortable that it addressed the issues Gary's bringing up in the part that I was part of at the Ed Alliance. But that's the whole thing. I'm, you're making an excellent point. If we're not keeping uh, the eye on the ball to, starting tomorrow with the hearings that this is about improvement, not about punishment, and that there really aren't that many ineffective teachers in reality, that everyone can be improved. And uh, hopefully that'll, that'll be what washes out of these hearings and not, the, not maybe what was in some of the legislation when it was first put together. I heard Senator Pavlov, I was, uh, who I thought had a, I thought said that in an appropriate way. So that's hopeful for tomorrow, that he sees this as an improvement-based um, document is receiving it that way. Michelle was next, I think, and then Dan. Yeah. Um, um, I'm, I'm wondering about with the uh, Common Core Standards, mm -hmm. 
with the test scores that are being used as part of the evaluation process is mandated. Um, uh, it seems like a, a lot of changes and a lot of things to, to align at the same time. So mm -hmm. with the, um, is there some accommodation or understanding that the scores may drop and be able to, and that that is going to, because of the cut, because of the Common Core? Yeah, be so good question. The, if we are able to go forward with the Common Core, and we hope mm -hmm. we are, and if we're able to go forward with an assessment in 1415, and we hope we are, um, they would have had their first Common Core assessment in the spring of 15. That would mean that their second Common Core assessment would be the first year of the actual implementation so that it wouldn't be springing a new test on them at the same time as springing a, um, a uh, statewide assessment, a statewide evaluation system. So there would be some, people would already mm -hmm. have had an opportunity to take that Common Core assessment one time and get used to that kind of assessment, that kind of um, very different type of assessment that we're going to have before that has to be, according to the recommendations at least, included into those overall evaluations. Okay. Good question, thank you. Dan, and then John. Um, thanks, Joseph. I uh, appreciate um, your effort to unpack uh, the report. Um, it is a multi-part question. I apologize in advance to my peers. And if the second one... I only asked one. I was saying if the second and third questions need to be held because others are in the queue, I'm happy to do so. Um, First question, and do you have any sense based on your conversation with educators around the state um, and of what percentage of districts you might expect to opt for um, student learning objectives as opposed to the kind of standardized assessments? So we would, I think that we do not know at this point really that, that that's because we don't have this kind of situation in place under required and we don't actually have those those optional state assessments up and running will be in 1415 um, we're not sure what we would actually hope is that they would do both you know get multiple sets of information um, of course up to the district but we we would hope <laughs> that they would do both because we think that both of those would be um, professionally useful yes sir um, number two uh, and three is very much tied to this, just around the data system <laughs> necessary to do this, just so you know. Number two is... We're going to have a vote at the end whether this was... <laughs> <laughs> Lupe's going to be the enforcer. I can't believe Lupe. the amount of love I'm getting. Oh, I love you guys. Oh, Back. Thank you so much. This is great. Um, I, measuring growth in high schools. So very different game from measuring K-8. Uh, we've got smarter balance, so on and so forth. High schools, but what's... So what... It, it, the report talks about using ACT, MME, 11th grade, and tying that back to something, testing the same content area in a much, much earlier grade. How do you actually then drill that down to individual educators, say at the 9th and 10th grade and 11th grade level, if, you're, if, you're, if it's a three-year bridge that you're, you're trying to connect? So that's actually why I made that distinction between the three through eight of being only applicable in fourth grade English language arts and mathematics for in individual teachers, the mandated state assessment where you might be able to have more applicability for a building administrator because they're responsible for what happens throughout an, a child's um, tenure in a, in a high school. So what happens from when they start high school to, to when they're in that the end of 11th grade, that that belongs to a building administrator. But what happens, in a, and it gets more tricky with individual teachers in a high school because in particular, you have <laughs> a lot more differentiation in math and science. So you have uh, you know, algebra one, geometry, algebra two, stats and probability. Then you've got, you've got biology, earth science, chemistry, physics. Um, so it, it doesn't make sense to hold uh, except for that very small portion that could be a building goal, going back to an individual educator, it doesn't make sense to hold them responsible for something that is general science if they're a physics teacher, right? So that's where we are going, where we are actually developing Michigan merit credit content assessments for each of the required credits. So, so they would be kind of pre-post. People would call them end of course, but we don't say course because it's credit, right? 
it's whether or not you're achieving the whole credit. So it could be a pre-post based on that credit. So we're developing that so it could be specifically looked at for individual educators based on their specific area of responsibility. But then again, that would be optional based on not mandating additional assessment. Mm -hmm. And the data system for all of this? So I, uh, you know, that's not my world, but I know just enough to be <laughs> dangerous. And this sounds really, um, this sounds pretty far from where we are today. So we currently have what's called the teacher student data link. Which does, which does have the link. So what happens it is we have the Michigan School Data System, CEPI. We have the Registry of Educational Personnel, CEPI, which used to not talk to each other at all. Completely separate. Student-focused, teacher-focused, principal-focused, and so on. What was built was a kind of a a link between the two through courses. So essentially what you do is you say, I as a district am offering this course. It could be a third grade general. It could be a high school physics. But we, we provide a course ID. We identify what core content area it, it, it aligns to. And then we link teachers to that. Or we link students to that course ID. And we link teachers to that course ID. And, and, and we're able to provide that teacher-student data link. We actually, this is our third year, no, is it, I, mean, I think it is our third year that we have provided back to districts for their use, as, as they see fit, a link between individual teachers and individual students that shows all of the assessment data for every student that each teacher saw. So we do have that. It is missing a couple of things. Fine-grained attendance so that you could say, because one of the recommendations is less than 90% of attendance automatically out of the van, right? Um, another one is um, an appeal system said, so, you know, this, this student had just a really horrendous year. Can I have this student taken out? C kind of something that was anticipated in the original legislation. Building that in. And then uh, a system where right now the individual teachers could go in and say, this is the roster that has been submitted by my district. Actually, that's not my student. Please take this student off. And then having any of those appeals, of those changes to it, be certified by the administrator who's responsible for that teacher. So those are the things that we're missing, but we're, we're quite a bit of the way there. I thought that was an excellent technique not to call that number three. <laughs> <laughs> Just to go end. <laughs> John. You guys are on to my tricks. I have to come up with some new ones. Stay on you, too. Try to. It's hard. You're turning. Um, thank you, Joseph. I've been very appreciative and supportive of the thoughtfulness and the dedicated to being supportiveness and the dedicated to improving learning outcomesness of this evaluation uh, effort. And so I think it's terrific. My, I've been most interested in are we going to get support for full implementation and paying for the training and the support and the different pieces? So, question is, as a, as I read the report, I interpreted we have four <coughs> okayed models for the, the um, classroom assessment. Classroom observations. D districts can choose any of the four. One is going to be sort of a state developed and deployed system, but we're going to pay for uh, the equivalent of what the state one costs for any of the four is how I interpreted it. That Though someone else was confused saying, which one's going to be the state approved? That's the only one we're going to pay for. So which is the recommendation? The recommendation of the MCEE is that the state issue an RFP that the four approved vendors could bid on, select one, and pay for the expense of all the training, the um, licensing, the hardware, so kind of some base cost mm -hmm. based on that RFP that the winning bidder and then any district could choose to use any one of the other three, and the state would pay that base cost for the districts that wanted to use one of the other three. That's the recommendation of the okay. MCE. I, that I think, I'm glad that's the recommendation. As people reading it, even thoughtful people, are not seeing that. They think that whoever the one is is the only one that's going to get paid for. And as we try to get legislative support for paying for it, I think it will be really helpful to say, no, we want to pay for any of these systems, but at a level that is hinged on the state developed system, right? Yeah, and I just, if I may add, because we worked this through last Friday, <clears throat> that not only would they have to pay the difference, mm -hmm. you know, let's say it's $500 they get and it's $800 their cost per, so they'd have to pay 300 
but in a way you have an inherent advantage to go with a state bid because we're going to get a better price. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, in theory, that's going to be an incentive, I think, for folks, but still have the option to go to one or the other. If, 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 if this is re if but, this but is But we're received. not trying to insist that everybody use the one option if we actually think there's four good variants. Right. right. So one of the right. Other but we are, we do, I mean, my interest obviously, I, if they're good variants to do the job, I want to make sure we're paying for them. Can I ask just a clarifying? Just yes. A bit. So you're saying um, if the the winner, whoever is selected, um, what the, their cost would be, um, that's the amount of money that would then a school district would get or a school would get to do For to take one of the others that may be more expensive, but they'll all get the same exact amount of funding. Yeah. So under the under the MCU recommendations, it would be a base a base cost and. As uh, Superintendent Flanagan said, we, were, we would most likely get a much better cost because there would be one portal between the state and the vendor rather than 700 portals between an individual district and the vendor. So it very likely that the state would get a much better cost. But again, allowing districts to adopt one of the other three, but at that base cost. So it would be the same amount of money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Thank you. And I think what would happen is some of them who've been, you know, my old district where I was superintendent, they're very, feeling very good that they've got labor and the board buy in on a particular model. And if that model didn't happen to be the one that won the proposal statewide, they pro my guess is they'd want to stay with it. And then they'd make a judgment to pay the incremental cost because they've already got, you know, this works for us and we feel good about it and we feel it's been fair. And, um, and that, I think that's a fair way to approach it, the way that your task, that, that uh, Dean Ball's group attended to it because theoretically, I, the challenge is going to be what John inferred. I mean, getting this funded fully to be implemented, and I think it might have given an angle to some who may not want to do that if we if we didn't have a fair approach to it that you just described. Fair from a fiscal point of view, I mean. Eileen, please. Um. I wanted to say a couple of things. The first one is that uh, the State Board of Education and, of course, uh, Deborah Ball need to market this as a market evaluation is lifting teachers, not punishing them. Uh, it's, it's very clear in her presentations that she views it that way. It's all clear in everything that we're doing, but we need to say it. Uh, I was talking to Gary briefly after the EAA was here this morning, and uh, the EAA doesn't understand marketing. I mean, they do, but they don't. They, they, they don't. they don't get out there and proactively tell people what they're doing because they're just busy doing it. So we have to be careful because uh, if, we're not, if we're not articulate on this, it will get away from us. Um, the second thing is I have a bunch of really bad examples, but um, uh, uh, we're going after a Lincoln Navigator. I tried, tried this out on Mark and it, or on Mike, and it fell down flat. So we, we may not you need said a Lincoln baseline Cadillac Navigator. to me. I didn't yeah, hear Cadillac, a Lincoln Navigator. Yeah, like I know. I'm going to Ford together. products. Yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe an Escort or um, or what do I have? An Explorer Focus. would do. Or uh, in an iPad application world, do we need a desktop? Or um, yeah, we really don't have space for a Greyhound. So so should we be looking at a Chihuahua or a Cocker Spaniel? And the reason I say this is that we want to do this. <laughs> we, we, I knew I'd get Dan. Yeah. I did it. <laughs> Chihuahua or the Cocker Spaniel? See, this is the big choice. So the, 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 my worry in this is that it's going to become so elegant and so wonderful that it won't ever fly. And I don't know how to do it other than how you're describing it, but I keep on thinking iPad, mainframe. I mean, look how quickly we've gone from that Hulk, uh, what, the first computer. Uh, was a building. <laughs> um, so is there a different way of doing this? If the legislature bulks at the cost, we don't want piecemeal, I think. That's what we said, yeah. Right. And if, if we feel that way, then can the incredible creativity that all 12 state employees have at the Department of Ed, coupled with the brains of a lot of people in the state, come up with any other way to do it that wouldn't be as, as expensive to make sure it gets done. And I, I don't know the answer to that, but I would rather not forego it. I would rather not have it collapse. And I, I'm not saying that's going to the happen. The question is, would there be a you go within this <laughs> navigator or whatever? I don't, and <laughs> that would take a lot of, I hope today with Cassandra's uh, and, and Marty's uh, work on this that maybe we can get some language that I think it's in there frankly but be sure to 
make sure it gets codified or at least reported um, before tomorrow or tomorrow morning. Who is next? I had a brief. Uh, yes, sir. Just on the on the data collection on teachers now, how do you handle situations like team teaching? Uh, I'd, I'd want to teach with uh, Gary here so that I, Mr. Abood, so that I would get a good rec, good uh, <laughs> score. Uh, and things like maternity leave or other things where a uh, class is divided between two or more teachers. So that, that's also a piece of the data system that I didn't mention that is missing. That's okay. kind of the one okay. last piece that I didn't mention, which is uh, percentage of, of, of responsibility. So in a data system, you might default to, I am 100% responsible for the achievement and growth of the student. Yeah. Or of the growth of the student, sorry, not achievement. Um, or I'm a team teacher, 50%, 50-50. Same kind of thing with um, special assignments, such as I am responsible for this particular student with this with a disability. Okay. As, and and I'm in a rig, I mean, I'm in a regular classroom, but I I'm responsible specifically for that individual student. Uh, how do I apportion that responsibility between the regular classroom teacher and me? So those are the kind of things that would also be built into this. That's one of the additional pieces that's missing. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. Kathleen, please. Yeah, there's another piece to that. The teachers change sometimes, in, especially in urban schools, sometimes the, the students are 100% different at the end of the semester than they were at the beginning. How do you measure that? Yeah, so there, there are several ways to do that, but the recommendation of the MCEE is that if a student is not there in the classroom for 90% of the class periods, they don't count for the individual teacher. So they might end up with no students who uh, know it is, it is possible, <laughs> the, although we haven't, uh, th there are many urban legends of that kind of <laughs> mobility. We actually don't see that happen very often. It may happen in a very small number of cases, but uh, the level of mobility that we've actually been able to see is not that high. But it, 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 it could it happen. It is high, though, in many places. I mean, you just know that teachers yeah. are changing the students. All, students are changing all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, these are questions on the whole though we you know it's I still repeat what we said last time that it's very thoughtful very careful very professional job and good timing because we'll be able to to talk about it under I to see level of support from the board Way laid it Thank out. You, and that's I didn't articulate very well but Tylene's point I meant that could be <laughs> some of that could be addressed also during uh, item I so we're good? Great, thank you. Thanks, Joseph. Great job, and I think you took a red eye to get back here. I've never made one smarter, <laughs> I'm the only chief, quote chief, who's never made one smarter balanced meeting at all. <laughs> and this one was in LA that he came back from last night, or maybe this morning, and so appreciate your being here. Um, we're going back to the regular meeting, or back up to the regular meeting, and the first item is the approval of minutes of regular committee meeting of the whole on August 13th. Moved by Dan, ordered by Cassandra. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Thank you. We did participation. We did new employees. President Austin, John, please. First, uh, thanks, Richard and Eileen, the Common Core testimony. We spent a long day there. But uh, I think the whole process of having those discussions, and hopefully I'm optimistic, as I hope everyone is, that they helped uh, uh, illuminate what really the Common Core is and the importance of it. And I'm hopeful the legislature will move soon to support its continuation. So thank everybody for helping out, too. Um, this process of us um, taking uh, the opportunity and need to inform recommendations and ideas of what school finance overhaul is needed. You know, the process that we're moving includes, and we did get some uh, graduate student assistance thanks to the MSU Ed Policy Center to mm -hmm. help distill, a, I think, a series of, of pieces. One, first, what are the big issues and drivers of the school finance uh, proposal, a 20 years of uh, living with that uh, crisis at the moment? Um, and it continues, I hope, to help develop, look, looks at other states, what 
they do to organize and finance their schools, uh, particularly ones that are high performers academically, and then what do we do about all this? What are our 5, 10, or 8, or 12 big fixes that we want to encourage? And that is also the same type of information material we're taking into the good work group with Bill Rogers and legislators that Cassandra and Eileen think you are participating in. So we've had two of those meetings. Uh, and uh, I think we're, you know, we're at the moment of uh, we brought one draft uh, digestion of the issues uh, from our uh, research team, began to discuss it at that meeting. I think it's something that we'll get some additional input into and uh, perspective on and maybe share two here, but also I want to arrange a time for any and all board members who aren't in that discussion group to meet together to look at that material and say what are the big issues in school finance, so I hope we can work out and figure out where best to do it for everybody that wants to just talk that piece through. And then uh, next steps, I think include, and the meeting we had most recently with the Rogers group included some of the proposal A veterans which was quite interesting. I love Glenn Oxender. I hadn't seen him in years, former oh Republican goodness. state uh, representative. So he's still a Republican, but he's a former <laughs> state <laughs> Republican. Uh, yeah, there, was a, there was interesting and fascinating uh, uh, reflections on their part and then the group's part on uh, you know, what they got right, what's changed in the world, and what needs fixing. So it was really very useful. Um, John, I'd like to interject. If you'll, if this, yeah. this group should know that his two major points were that they ate lunch a lot, <laughs> and that it required a major, major crisis of epic proportions to get change made. Mm -hmm. And barring that, it's very hard in state government to find a way to uh, 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 make something happen. Well, and also I think it's yeah, you know because you lived through it. I mean, it's interesting because not all the representatives, even in that room, were around at that time. So some of what Emerson and John Born. Hall and Oxender and others is news to the current legislators, certainly. Um, and some of us have just been around long enough to remember when that happened. But they, they had a few years of folks working on this thoughtfully together. When the crisis came in the right form, they were able to grab it, which uh, you know, some version of the crisis is here. <laughs> yes. So we need to figure they out They think it is because it. they want to do something about the right. 55 districts that are the deficit. They want to have a special meeting, a special task force, a special list. So we'll, uh, I'll think get the crisis. meeting for state board members to look at the research products and, and uh, what we're learning and uh, we'll continue on this, uh, this path. Okay, thanks John. <clears throat> I wanted to tag on to John's uh, comment a little bit because I think <clears throat> my experience, particularly in this job, but even in some of the other positions, is that we could do both. We could do, I thought it was a really well done and thoughtful report and we're happy to staff it with Wendy as you see fit to, to move the ball on the big picture report that you're working with Rogers. And, and then I do think there's a second way which is more immediate for incremental funding. It's not for the big picture. But for example, I think after 20 years of rhetoric, the way we got the early childhood funding was specifically putting it in MDE budget, specifically making a pitch with rationale behind it, and then ultimately getting board support here, governor support, legislative support. It didn't solve the big picture and shouldn't be either or. I mean, we've got to, I'm with you 100%, we need to look at this that way. But I'm, but I'm pitching a little bit here that you'll see in a moment. I, I do think there's an opportunity if you look at what happened with Willow Run and Ipsy last year that when the legislature even put in a modest amount of money, $10 million, we were able to affect change in one district that I think both of them would have been in deficit, probably at some point with an emergency manager. Both were headed down the tubes in terms of achievement, where I think they're, it's given them an opportunity to restructure and rethink how they're doing that. I think one of your kids is even involved in a result of that, that at, the, at the, the, the tech high school. So, I mean, it's a great example, and what we're going to try to pitch is that I, I think there's been a bit of a miss, I'm, I'm mostly responsible for this, by the way, but a, mid, a bit of a misunderstanding about consolidation of services, because right now we have $5 million in the budget and a grant out proposal right now to districts, but it's for consolidation of districts. They took out the word consolidation of services. And what we're hoping to get is an equal amount somewhere along the line, a supplemental worst case next year, 
for incentives for districts to try to move towards consolidation of services. So last year you were allowed to do both. I think ironically because of the success of Ypsilanti and well Iran, it got narrowed down to that for focus. But we're going to pitch because I think a mistake I made was certainly inferring one size fits all in the beginning and it doesn't. And that's where the studies that say it doesn't save money, it doesn't save money if you had a one size fits all. But you can't say, if I may just be this direct, that Barry County with two districts and 4,000 kids and a whole ISD, those kids might not be better served, to be blunt, with one district going to Kent and one going to Calhoun. So if you looked at this incrementally, that might be something with an incentive that they'd be willing to think about, just the same way that Ypsilanti and Willow Run were. So I mean, that that's more a carrot pr approach, you know, that we hope we could get board support to. So, so what I'm getting at is they're not either or. You go the big picture and try to get it, because I, I agree. I think it is a crisis now. I, 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 get, I get Eileen's point that because of um, Kalkaska, that one appeared to be more um, uh, timely at that time, 20 years ago. But it really was building. And I think we, we have, kind of to Kathy's, Kathleen's point, I mean, this issue related to the incoming deficit districts with regularity and more to come tells us that do that. But I'm asking that we also think about supporting in our budget things like the incentive money to try to move the ball where it makes sense. And where, where I think the studies, as I said, I think have missed it is it's because even, even uh, with no malice, even the, uh, uh, the person working on the big report pulled out a study that had to do mainly with consolidation of districts as opposed to services. And um, so bottom line is we're hoping to get an equal amount of money at some point so that districts could have an incentive to try to build this service structure and not have it put on them, you know, and let it work over time. And when you show success, and then not have it happen in places where it doesn't, where it doesn't make sense. But, you know, I, I would end with one last thought about that, that it's, it's kind of interesting because it's gotten a fair amount, more than we anticipated, and then a fair amount of blowback. And it's like if we had exactly the right level of, um, of structure right now and that you really didn't need to consolidate services anywhere, then wouldn't it follow that, well, let's just reduce everything to services being at each of the 4,000 buildings? And obviously that doesn't make sense. So why is it by happenstance that it just happens to be exactly the right formula now for services, whether it's in Wayne County or Barry County? It's just not, so our attempt, feeble that to some degree, more on me, was to try to get across the point that you can do this surgically and that's kind of the way we're gonna to start to try to re reestablish this because I do think it has legs and to the degree it does and we could get five million dollars for districts what's the downside I guess that's the way we're looking at it and not that in any way it's the big answer to any big picture it's just not you know it's just one piece but there's some legs with it and then one other thing that hit me when Joseph was reporting if you don't think that superintendents because I've seen it in just this evolution of this one little topic now that they and principals realize that 50% of their evaluation is going to be based on students' growth, they're not interested in burgers and buses anymore either. They're not interested in what? In, burgers in what and we're buses. calling burgers and buses. They're, they're fine with let someone else be responsible. I've, I've got a lot of work to do to move this aircraft carrier around. And, and now that I'm being held that directly accountable, I think you're going to see more of a willingness to say, why are we doing that? You know, when it makes sense. And when it doesn't make sense, you know, that's where I think I didn't do very well in, in some of that as it got kind of away from us. About your consolidation stuff. Um, so the schools would still operate it, and they wouldn't necessarily close schools. It would just be, because I know I've talked to people who have gone through consolidation in the more rural areas, and they're talking about bus trips, like two-hour bus trips one exactly. way for their kids elementary school kid. That's where it wouldn't make sense. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But they've been feeling compelled or whatever to, to do that. Emphasis. Right. No, that's right. And I, and I mean, the focus has to be on services up and then let the incentive system work for those that might want to consolidate their districts themselves. And even if you consolidate districts, that often doesn't mean you're closing the schools. It may mean that you're just consolidating the two central office functions. And kind of the way we laid out the consolidation of services, you know, I'm 
Barry won't like this maybe because I don't know, but I think I've been an intermediate soup and I've been a local soup. You don't know what level of service you have if you haven't been in one that's a full service ISD. Do you implement um, consolidation in your No, I just meant a, a, yeah, we did actually. We went from we went from 25 districts on our computer system that cost $5 million in new software to 100 districts on that. So what it did was 100 districts got their payroll, report cards, parent letters, and everything done through our system and didn't have to pay $5 million. And it was just, you know, I'm not chucking for Wayne Risa any more than anyone else, but theoretically Wayne Risa could do that for the whole state. And the incremental costs would go down, you know, and take a million plus kids with a one $5 million expenditure rather than a bunch of $5 million expenditures. And I, and I think there's another reason for this. The more we can show that, I do believe there's a connection between those that aren't quick with some of us to do taxes. I mean, I would do a service on sales tax tomorrow if I could, you know, with, on services. But those that aren't quick to do it, I think there's a lot in the middle that if they really believe, we're trying everything else. We've gotten rid of the duplication of $5 million of software over and over and over again. We've, we've centralized it. We've, where it made sense, moved services up. And that then they're more open to, okay, let's think about the revenue side then. I mean, that's, so anyway, that's, that's my report. Could I? I don't know if you're... Are you, are you email, still doing but, your report? What's that? No, I just wanted to oh. respond. I think we, I certainly, and all of us would support any and all ways that we can encourage uh, shared service consolidation when it helps save money, particularly being repurposed in effective ways to encourage consolidation. And I appreciate your uh, um, continued also acknowledging it's also healthy for us to look for additional big things we need to do to overhaul the way we organize and fund schools, but you know, very supportive of whatever incentives and funding we can get from those who want. That would be great. I mean, maybe the committee could even endorse, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, an incentive of $5 million for service. Incentive. Mm -hmm. It's voluntary for people to apply or not, like they've done on the regular one. Yes, ma'am, and it's my report, but you can go ahead. I see that the, the uh, Appropriations Committee is going to have a hearing on the day after tomorrow at which you will be testifying and giving your report. Can you give us, uh, tell us what you're going to this time? Well, this is the mandated deficit. Yeah, that's the mandated deficit. What are you, you going to say this time? I mean, last time you proposed this consolidation. So are you going to propose anything? Well, la say? last time, just to be accurate, well, you never know. I mean, <laughs> as Marty would say, as Marty would say after it, that wasn't in the script. Uh, no, I don't plan to, uh, but I, I, I would like to pitch what I just said to you. I would like to say to them that I think there's an opportunity uh, based on, it, just, just to be factual for a minute, I admit two meetings ago, I'm, supposed, I'm ordered to do this quarterly. When I, this first came out as an order, frankly, I was resistant to it. I thought it didn't seem, this is going to sound more about me than I mean it to be, but I, I didn't know that it was appropriate that you can take an independent constitutional officer and have them come before four times um, but having said that there's no downside I mean we should help the legislature understand the deficit problem and I think it's turned out to be a blessing in disguise but at first I was going to say well I shouldn't say what I was going to say so we've done these for two years now and two meetings ago admittedly I wandered off script and said if I had my way you know and services and blah blah and then we got charged really with bring something back and I think I could have and probably should have handled that one differently but bottom line is it's reduced to what I just described in terms of what our ask is of them that if you really want to reduce deficit districts one of the concrete things you can do just one small one is at least put some incentive money in there for districts where it makes sense to drive these services up and, and give us some money give districts some money the way they're doing on is five million in there for consolidating districts. There's no money in there for consolidating services. So that would be the only thing I would okay. plan to say. Everything else is that we send. I think we can send it to you beforehand. But everything that we do is is really formatted now. We just report the number of the new ones, the ones that got off, the ones that look to be coming on. This particular 
quarterly is a little bit more difficult because there's not audit reports back yet, so some of this is anticipated who's going to be in deficit. And then it's gotten kind of, um, for lack of a better word, it's a kind of routine. You know, we're reporting the facts, and but we'll, we'll and I'll, I've been encouraged, and I'm receiving this as also encouragement not to wander off to another area. So I, other than that one thing I mentioned, I won't do that. You could talk about the Syria situation and yeah. whatever, <laughs> how we can get that worked out. <laughs> 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 okay. Yes, are we good then? And Gary, you're up. And we're looking forward to your first report. And Terrific. <laughs> thanks for being here and your your intelligent participation Thank today you. was appreciated. Um, do I have a minute to connect over there so sure. I can show you some things? Okay. I'm doing what you have to do special. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Just keep touching it. Yeah, I keep. Okay. Um, Thank you. That was excellent. Okay, we're going to the next. <laughs> the shortest one. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I while we're waiting, it was brilliant, Gary. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, this was just logged in before. Yeah, that's true. You want it seriously? Well, I'm waiting. I can. How about we approve it? Yeah, he's getting hot. Yeah, can I? Sure. Well, I think Gary's ready now. Yeah. We could. <laughs> While Gary's doing that, do you want to um, I'm want to sorry. move to I thought I could just jump right on that machine and show you, but no worries. We'll get it. We'll, we'll do some other things. Take your time, Gary. We're going to go to consent agenda for a okay. minute. Or, or maybe the approval will go in order. The approval of the State Board of Ed meeting schedule for 2014. Motion first? <laughs> no. Well, sure. Um, I move to adopt. Move to adopt. Support. Support, support by John. Now discussion, Eileen. Uh, I can't make the April 8th meeting. It's spring break for seventh graders that I know. Oh. So, uh, if you wanted to hold it the April Fool's Day, I could make it, or the 15th, which is the start of Passover. Uh, other than that, you'll be doing it without me, which is fine for you and okay for me, too. Would you like to take a look at a possible? good for me. Yeah, Passover starts the 15th. It's okay. I don't have the next year's calendar with me. Oh, good. That's a really Yeah, I, I know I have that one. I oh, have it here. Oh, oh no, I, I see. No, I mean, I don't have this one. Oh, oh, God. Oh, I understand. Yeah, we lose a few of some people. Yeah. We what day did you say was so Passover? Far. Pardon me? What day was the, well, on the 15th? So it's either the first then or no change? Eileen says it's the um, It's April, uh, it's the April 8th meeting. Uh, right. The first is the uh, Tuesday and it's April Fool's Day. And the 13th, is, I'm sorry, the um, 15th is uh, the start of Passover that night. Yeah, usually that's, I couldn't do it that day. You can't do it. Yeah, I can't do it on the 15th. About, no. so 15th out. Any consideration for the first? Oh, the first. first. Do it on a Wednesday. Wow. <laughs> That's radical. <laughs> but those, are, in case you don't have calendars, should we, unless you feel you can account for that now, we, or you do? Would you rather do the 16th Wednesday? No. That's the Holy Week, and we have services. So is the first? First is okay for me. Is fine. All right. So I am. Mertz. 
you're, it, you're a key here. It, 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 you know, it is a little problematic. Between that one and the next one. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. It would be, <laughs> were you guys able to hear it would be six weeks between that one and the next one if we moved it to the first. That doesn't mean we maybe can't move the other one, too, then, if you felt. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should just keep the eight. Yeah, it's, I understand. Yeah, as usual. There you go. Okay. Have Danny calling. Yeah. <laughs> he has delusions of far travel. Okay. All right. So, any other discussion? So, it's the original tab here. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great. Thank you. Gary, you want me to go one more item? Sure. Okay. We're going to go to, well, we're not going to do state and federal. That's a little bit. How about the consent agenda? Um, Approval of the consent agenda. Moved by John, supported by Dan. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Cool. Comments by state board members? Maybe we could do some of that. I did have something I wanted. I don't know if uh, any of you have heard that Liz Bauer is going to be inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. Oh, oh good. Year. I think it's October 17th. Is anyone going to be there? I'm going to be there. Uh, I, I wondered if there's any interest in getting an ad in the, their journal that, from oh. the board congratulating her on it. Yeah. A quarter page ad is $125. That's so nice. Is that okay yeah, with everybody? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll work with you when you're yeah. <laughs> designing something. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I, think I still have her photo. Yeah, you have a photo. Okay. And, yeah. We have one up there. I, mm -hmm. We have an electronic photo on file, I believe. Pardon me? I think I have one, but if not, I'll contact you for and it. it why, I'm sure most of us would chip in for whatever so why not right. like signal to... Right, that's what I mean. We would we'd know chip in, whatever it is. right? Yeah. Okay, I'll chip in. Great. You okay, Yardley? Sure. Okay. I would, too. Are you, too? Okay. Sure. Great. Can't vote, but I, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> I can't vote, but I can no, contribute. Right? There you go. Wow, I wish everything was that easy. Wow. You can buy a vote. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, now, yeah. after all these yeah, years. Kind of party. <laughs> oh. yeah. Thank you. Other board comments? Yes, thank you, Matt. Rick. I, uh, I have signed up because NASB's paying for it. Um, <laughs> For the uh, conference they're having in Pittsburgh is September 20th on Next Generation Science Standards. I'm, okay. I'm still struggling with the, uh, the age appropriate. Um, and, and part of the problem is they want to teach, you know, the theory or the ideas to kids in younger grades. We tried to do it with modern math, or yeah, with the new math. Um, but, uh, but I want to get, so I want to get some more discussion on these and uh, and they and they're paying for up to three members so anyone else wants to go to Pittsburgh uh, Friday and it's Pittsburgh in the fall I mean you can't beat it really <laughs> no I'm actually if Boston can knock us I think we can <laughs> um, on a serious note is that between now and the next board meeting it is yeah because that's tentatively when we had thought about bringing the standards back. Mm -hmm. that would be, um, maybe that would, so maybe others would want to consider that and we get to Mertz if you're interested in, in also attending. Thinking about it, yeah. What weekend is that? What's it? What week, what day is that? That's a Friday, September 20th. So you your thoughts and if Thursday you'd like to night, attend, is that the idea? please let Mertz know. Any other board members on the comments section? Okay. Yeah. Then we're going to Mr. Abu. Going to yes, sir. To Pittsburgh. Thank you. Yeah. And I look forward to being part of the Next Generation Science Standards conversation. Um, I, as part of this, you'll kind of hear some some of the context for that and the tie-in. Um, so I'm Gary Abu, and just to kind of reintroduce myself to those who I haven't met yet, and and to those who I do know, I've been teaching chemistry and physics and biology to high school students for the past six years. I started my career in Arizona, but I came back home to Michigan, and I've been teaching at Gross Point North High School now for three years. So you might be wondering, if you don't know me already, who this guy is. And so I'd just like to tell you a little bit about myself, show you part of my classroom, and then tell you about some of the things I've been up to and that I'm going to be up to for this year. 
So as a science teacher, I got my original training at Wayne State University. I was on track to do their pre-med program and go to medical school, but through some practical experiences in a hospital setting doing medical research, I learned that I had a true calling for teaching. So I went back to school to earn my master's degree in education at Saginaw Valley State. Um, I am happily married to another teacher who my wife teaches special education to high school students. I'm a runner and a cyclist, and this year I have a new role in Gross Point as an instructional coach. Um, it's a, a really great, great role and a great opportunity, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. Uh, so as part of the, the Being Michigan Teacher of the Year, I've gotten a number of requests to provide staff development around the state already, and over the summer I was very active in providing staff development and spent about two to three weeks working with teachers around the state. Um, I trained a one-week workshop on next generation science standards for chemistry teachers, as well as worked with the Troy Public Schools for all of their middle school and high school teachers on next generation science standards. I also spent an extensive amount of time working with teachers on educational technology and instructional best practices. I've also had the pleasure of teaching at the graduate level courses in learning theory and instructional practice and pedagogy, and so I've been able to share a lot of my expertise over the summer already. The district um, in Gross Point, the administrators saw this as a tremendous opportunity for me to be able to share my expertise and help all of our teachers augment their practice and move towards 21st century teaching and learning. So they asked me to step away from the classroom this year and to work with K-12 teachers uh, doing instructional coaching. And what I've been doing over the past couple of weeks is going into classrooms and seeing all of the buildings in our district. And I've seen nearly every elementary school classroom thus far. Later this week, I'll be visiting the other middle schools, and I've visited the, uh, our rival high school. What I've seen is tremendous, and I'm looking forward to working with teachers in grade level teams, subject area teams, and also in uh, vertical teams. So doing some one-on-one -on -one and group coaching, as well as providing staff development, is what I've been up to and what I will be up to this year. That being said, I wanted to give you a little glimpse of what my classroom looks like so you can kind of have a sense of where I come from as both a science teacher and an integrator of technology into my classroom. So this is a clip from my physics and chemistry classes last year, and it shows um, them engaging in inquiry-based practices, collaborative learning, project-based learning, and using mobile devices in the classroom. We run a bring your own device class where students can use whatever mobile device they have to engage and augment their learning and to help support teaching practice. So this was a short segment, a trailer from a larger piece. It was a 15-minute tutorial introducing teachers as part of the REMC Association's Connected Educator Series. And what they asked me to do is to come in and feature my classroom and some of the things that we were doing and to put together a screencast instructing teachers on how to get started using mobile devices in the classroom. So this was an excerpt from that project last year. Um, it's really been a, a, a great honor to, to be awarded Michigan Teacher of the Year, and it's really helped me think of education beyond the four walls of my classroom and building. And this summer has been really exciting and informative to me and helping me understand the, the bigger picture of education and the role that I play in that and the role that all of you and all of us play in that. Um, the last thing I'd like to share with you, and you may have seen this already, is uh, last week, just after Labor Day, the Detroit Free Press <laughs> came out. Um, they came out and wanted to interview me to ask me tips for starting the school year. And I said, I'm really sorry I can't meet with you. I'm going to be working with teachers. And they said, tell us about that. And I was giving an orientation seminar for all of our new teachers in the district um, and teaching them about 21st century teaching and learning. We were going through activities they could use in their classroom to get started with creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking. 
It turned into more than a segment about advice for the school year, and it became a front page article um, above the crease, <laughs> which I found out is a big deal, above the crease where they came out and featured me working with You're teachers. Ready. Above the fold? <laughs> oh, okay. You can Thank just you. Quit. You can just retire. That's it. You made it. So this is kind of a, a, a really great moment for me, but also for our school and for teaching because the article featured so many things that were not, not part of the traditional stereotype of classroom teaching, and I really liked that, that we were talking about 21st century teaching and learning and that we were able to give that, that message out to the public, which doesn't always get there. And in hearing a lot of the work that you're already doing and that came up today, it just made me think that all of us in education hear these great things and we're exposed to it, and we don't always get that message out to the public, kind of like what was said earlier. That PR piece is something I'm hoping to do this year. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gary. John and I didn't get any applause, you noticed. No, running and cycling. Never. Can I ask, we have to have fun. Can I ask one question? I learned to swim in 25, so yeah, not sure. very strong. Are there any, were there any students that didn't have their own mobile device? They, there were about 20% uh, of the students did not have their own mobile device. And so what I did is I went out and purchased um, a class set of mobile devices to lend out to those students um, to kind of fill in the gap. You oh, you purchased them yourself? Yeah. Now, um, teachers, the teachers, the teachers do. <laughs> but there, you know, there are some creative solutions I think for doing BYOD programs that can fill in the gap with less funding than it would require to do a full one-to-one -one program, and uh, there are some some creative conversations I think that could really be, really should be considered um, for districts that are considering mobile devices but aren't at the place where they can fully go one-to-one -one yet. John, uh, please. Um, with this instructional uh, leadership role, uh, was that something that Grosse Point had done before with others, or was it sort of created? Given it, your it was kind of created. Um, one of the things they noticed was that I was already getting a lot of requests to be pulled away from the district and sort of being proactive to make sure there was minimal impact on student learning. They decided it would make the most sense to have me serve a role outside of the classroom this year so that students could get a consistent teacher in front of them and that I could also help to augment teaching and learning around the district. You know, it's the kind of role it would be great if we somehow created conditions in which more districts felt they mm -hmm. could you know, organize that type of effort and support it yeah. uh, for their teachers and for everybody. Yes. Yeah. Well, and you know, hopefully as, as the year goes on and I can report back to you some of the things that I've come up with, um, hopefully we could maybe work to, to create a model to, to showcase with other districts that might be interested. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gary. Mm -hmm. That's great. Marty and Cassandra. I guess Marty kicks it off. I will kick it off. I'll keep it brief. Um, like what has been discussed already uh, today, that the House, a joint House Senate Education Policy Standing Committee will meet tomorrow. Your testimony from Dr. Deb Ball on the MCEE recommendations, and also from Sandy Jacobs from the National Council on Teacher Quality as they begin to draft um, legislation to move forward on the educator and administrator evaluations. Um, a joint House and Senate Education Approach Committee is also hearing um, a Thursday to have testimony, the quarterly testimony from uh, Mike on the Deficit Districts Report. And in fact, um, to kind of take advantage of John's offer to have the board support Mike's upcoming recommendation uh, to the board, uh, Mike asked me to put together a brief statement that maybe the, the board could support um, so that we can give to the, the legislature along with Mike's presentation on Thursday to support um, no less than $5 million to fund grants for pilot projects for the to drive the consolidation of services to the ISD level. So I don't know if we want to take care of that now or do it when we take care of the other um, statement that Cassandra will discuss. What were you thinking, John? Well, we can, we can do it now if, if people are going to discuss that a bit and uh, encourage support of uh, that position. I appreciate, Mike, you're bringing it to us. Okay. So can I consider that for discussion purposes a motion? And I, I move support of the statement as, uh, as Marty read. Okay. Support? Supported by Richard. Further discussion? I'm sorry, can you 
Thank sure. You. In an effort to provide financial and systemic incentives uh, for local school districts to consolidate their administrative functions and responsibilities to the uh, intermediate school district level, the state board moves to encourage the legislature to appropriate no less than $5 million to fund grants for pilot projects to drive consolidation of services to the ISD level. Pretty short, simple, direct. I just have a question about the consolidation process. Uh -huh. So um, when there is a consolidation process, what happens to the employees? Is there any sort of recommendations or regulations that they're, um, when that happens, that, well, for instance, if they're in a labor union, does it, does their, what happens to them in that situation? Is it is it ruled by Merck uh, rulings on it, or is it ruled? Is there some? I, I'm just looking at the downside right. and mm -hmm. how it some negative effects that it might have, and I just want some. Well, more. I think in the you know if we look at last year's experience and the proposals that come in, I mean what this would in effect do. Let's face it, is it would get it back to where it was last year, which is, there was ten million dollars for consolidation of districts and consolidation of services. Now there's five million for just consolidation of districts and this would kind of try to put it back to a par and then they in their proposals would describe how that may or may not. Okay. And I, um, but there's no um, like uh, necessarily recommendations or direction from the department about how the, that the, should, how that should. If we were to flow. get, if we were to get that we would, we can bring back um, criteria for that grant. Why don't we do that? If they were able to, in a supplemental, um, uh, allow, you know, because that's the earliest it would be, it would be possibly a supplemental, maybe not till next year. Then we would bring criteria back for that grant, as we do for the others, correct? Correct. And then that's where we could make sure that that was accounted for. Because what they did, you know, part of this is trying to offer some sugar and some carrots for folks to think about it. Boards would have to approve it, local boards for even to be even be able to submit a proposal, but we could we could shape criteria as the board sees fit for that grant. And what the language um, consolidate administrative services, Administra um, functions and responsibilities. Yeah. So help me with that. I've always been uh, well, the notion of non-instructional services mm -hmm. um, being regionalized and consolidated at a broader level. Uh, is that the same thing? And is administrative services, non-instructional services, is there any helpful clarification what would you, here? What would you prefer? I, I prefer non-instructional services, but I don't know what administrative services mean. Yeah, what does mean. it mean? Yeah. What is it? Well, we can say, we can say non-instructional, mm -hmm. be clear. So there's there's the room for both, but I think there's this is such a drop in the bucket in some ways. It's trying to get the thinking going, really. So why not? Well, could, could, what is the difference between administrative and non-instructive? Okay, I'm thinking administrative. That's just like the financial, the sort of the administration level functions. Or am I misunderstanding? Because the non-instructional seems broader and would include like bus drivers and maybe cafeteria workers or you know what, secretary, actually, secretaries. I mean, I what's the difference between? The but I would. I don't know if it will matter much. I mean, if, so we'll come. We'll get back with criteria, and then it'll depend on who actually applies for it, right? Right. 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 I just didn't know if there was a difference if we're changing the language from the proposal. Like, are we changing the pop, the people, well, the actual it, functions? Yeah. It, it would be the board's will on that. I mean, I either language is fine. I, I need to throw out another yes. question too, which is that at this, uh, if you put down ISDs, then charters won't be eligible for consolidation um, uh, treatment under the, under a grant like that. And you certainly could have in an area where you have enough charters uh, pulled together, there could be a reason for them to uh, economize uh, well, too. Why wouldn't they? Is it's intermediate school districts, and they're not; they're individual, aren't they? they well, no, we 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 did. We did computer services for I, for charters. Well, you just don't want to do anything that will exclude them, and they're not an intermediate school district, is my understanding. They're Somewhere. a school district, but not. Well, they're an LEA, just like a traditional district. Right. But they can, it's, like in DC, the, effectively, the ISD, the state superintendent's office, they handle transportation for all the schools in the district, charter and traditional. Like, I don't know why. I don't. I'm not aware of anything. Just the opposite. I'm saying what? Yeah. 
no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying you don't want to have language in there that would exclude charters from being able to band together to do something as a, a, a reduction in cost, a consolidation of service. They don't Not have to the band ISD together. They can do it through the ISD. It's just right. districts. Why can't they do it through the ISD? Maybe districts. Why can't they do it through the ISD? Because they're not part of the ISD. Well, in other words, they're they don't located in the that area. They are. Yeah, this, we, is, this says ISD level. Yeah. Yeah. For we me would create space for let's do something to share services at that regional level where it makes sense. Wayne does computer yeah. services for charters. On about you know those that wish to have it. The hundred I mentioned that they moved towards some of those were charter schools. Well, come so. does too. Uh, this is, so this is probably relevant too. Just in the criteria, it should just. You know, yeah, we could be clear. Yeah, and we would obviously bring the criteria back if this were to even happen. Is, is this likely to speed up the privatization of services? I think, you know, my view is I think if we talk about more vibrant ISDs, uh, not more likely. Because ISDs can, can do this. And it's not to put a value either way. I'm just saying... Right now, if you look at what's happened without people consolidating services, what's happened? There's been a lot more that's gone. You know, my, my fear, and this isn't like a pro or anti-privatization ar argument so much, but I was always aware of Pontiac when I was a local superintendent where they were privatized until they couldn't make any money, and then overnight they weren't privatized. So I was always cautious and felt that if we had our own employees and had our own plan, uh, that's my own. I'm speaking as a, for myself here to say that. But I just think you increase the chances of a thoughtful, economical approach at an ISD level. And when that doesn't happen and there's not money saved there, then what ends up happening, just look at the evidence is, is, is people are going, you know, I don't want to fault people that are making decisions at a board level to go privatize. But I just remember. <laughs> Suddenly it was pulled out. This is 20 years ago, so I don't mean to make it a current issue, but they, the, the rug was pulled out from underneath Pontiac like the day before school opened, and suddenly they had to scramble and try to hire workers and get kitchen equipment back and all that. I'm not sure I should have even said that. That's just my own. That's not really an anti-privatization as much as my own comfort level with what we were trying to do then. But I think, you know, the, I don't want to overstate this too much because I think the criteria building can really help I mean, shape this as you see fit. You criteria as the best um, places that have found ways to cut costs and services have, if they bid it out, they make it very explicit that your organized labor or whoever's providing a service is a, it's an equal, you know, opportunity to get it and win it. Things like that. Well, I mean, those would all be spelled out in the criteria. We privatize and then find they didn't do a very good job, and the, the right. local district has to supervise, and they don't always do that very effectively. So mm -hmm. I think it's a problem when they privatize. So. No, I agree. I just in shaping the criteria for how you do this, you can shape the opportunity for it not to end up as yeah. you described. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dan, please. I was just going to uh, recommend that we take the vote. Whatever the right language is. Okay. Taking yeah. Lupe's yeah. job yeah. away. Yeah. Yeah. Right from Lupe. Falling <laughs> down on her job here. Well, I said a motion. We had a motion and a second. <laughs> the question was called. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Same. Okay. Great. Thank you. Marty. And at, the, um, at the legislative committee meeting, um, a draft order. statement was um, started. And after then calling, I'm sorry, but after calling the question, shouldn't we have voted on the motion? That's what I thought, I thought. I think that's what we thought we were just doing. Uh -oh. No, the motion oh. to call the question, right? Is that what oh, you're asking? Oh, the motion was. Oh. We voted yeah. to call the question, call the but then we didn't proceed to the main motion. Okay. Okay. Should I do it over again? How can we vote on the motion? <laughs> I just still wanted to make sure that this would allow a group of, of, uh, of charters to pull together and consolidate services. I think that's the goal, not that it would not to restrict uh, this funding to ISDs, or is it to restrict the funding to ISDs? No, I, I think there's a way to word that that says any cluster of LEAs or the ISD, because I think you're probably right. There's, there's points where even within an ISD, it might even be so-called traditional districts might want to cluster around, I don't know, Utica 
for the sake of discussion, San Judy, or, and would like to do something with them. So we could, I think that was we, the spirit of that. You. It was just trying to move towards economies of scale. Yes. And Thanks. it wouldn't have to be centric. So I, I'm going to do my Robert's homework and debrief today, yeah. but in the case <laughs> you're correct, and I think you may be, can we do that then and call yeah. actually the question? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. same. This is to vote, right? This is to vote. <laughs> so we already voted on calling the question. We're Correct. Voting right. On the now we're voting on the motion. I abstain. Okay. <laughs> sure, abstaining on both. No, I would have voted for the first one. Calling the question. Calling the question. Okay. I'm fine with that. Okay. And then, and now we're actually voting on the motion. Yeah. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. No. Abstention. I'm going to abstain vote. too. Okay. Okay. So I'll hand it off to Cassandra to discuss the uh, statement on the sure um, board the support of the Michigan Council of Educator Effectiveness. Thank you, Marty. Um, well, we've talked about this a lot today, so I think everyone's now up to speed on, on what this is, but the MCE report really was something that was presented, or well, should be presented to the Governor's Office, the Legislature, and the State Board of Education. And as such, the Legislative Committee thought that it was important for us to weigh in um, and the timing seems to be perfect, considering that the legislature is going to be meeting this week to discuss um, the MCE report. Um, and so we drafted the uh, attached um, statement that you should have, and I think we have copies. Mm -hmm. Yep. Should we um, have a motion before we? That'd be good. Um, I would. Uh, oh, you'll move. Okay, okay. I'll second it. All right. Moved by Cassandra, supported by Kathleen. Kathleen. Now okay. discussion. Okay. So the statement really highlights a number of things within the um, recommendations. One being that the recommendations really are to support and improve teaching and learning, and not to punish teachers, which we all um, appreciated that particular goal. Um, also that it's both for teachers as well as administrators. Um, we also thought it's important that uh, there be professional learning opportunities to go along with the recommendations. Um, so we certainly support that as well because part of this really is training folks to be able to do this type of work. We also recognize that the recommendations are going to come with um, additional costs to the state. And so we recommend that the state uh, adequately fund the resources necessary to fully implement uh, the recommendations. Um, also thought that it's important that the MCE recommendations in order to be fe effective are incorporated within our colleges of education um, to include the evaluation process uh, for their uh, prospective teachers and administrators as well. Ultimately, we say that we endorse the MCE recommendations and we call on the legislature and um, the administration, if they're going to um, approve these recommendations, it is our intent that they be improved in their entirety. Uh, these recommendations and this, this program will not work if um, the legislature begins to pick it apart and then rebuild it um, in, in whatever manner they deem um, they'd like to see. We think that it needs to be approved in its entirety or you know, move along. But if we start picking at it, then the whole thing is just, it, it's not as strong and uh, it will not work quite as effectively. Um, I do have one minor change in the last paragraph. We say, the second um, line says, recognizing the complexity of effective teacher evaluation. That should be educator evaluation. So I would recommend that we make that change. Um, and then again, the last last sentence says that we support the adoption of the report's recommendations in its entirety. Further discussion, John. And, um, and Michelle <coughs> has a, a, like a sentence that she would like to propose, which I hope we'll um, discuss and, and endorse. Um, and but I just want to re reiterate Cassandra's points and the thank the committee too for your work. Um, as you heard from Joseph, and thank Joseph and the committee, from my view, the, the genius and utility of that commission's work was it took what could be a potentially punitive or gotcha teacher evaluation, teacher tenure reform process, and this is the key to teacher tenure reform, and put it in an expert-led but also a 
uh, a group that wanted to figure out how this can work with and for teachers and help them improve and be supportive and something they believe in and that they help create. And so that's what I think was produced. And it does, it's just all recommendations now. It does require legislative action and it requires funding and requires changes to the law that passed that set it in motion too, the teacher tenure law. So there needs to be action. So I think given that the report was to us, the governor and the legislature, we need to weigh in very strongly as I think we are to encourage the governor and legislature to now do their bits that we endorse the report and that we very strongly support its implementation and its um, funding, which is so critical. Mm -hmm. and did you want to attend to the sentence, Michelle? Yeah, um, <coughs> the sentence would go at the end of the third paragraph, which states the report, let me make sure I'm doing this right, yeah, where it starts, the SPE um, commends the, oh, it's the second paragraph, <laughs> I can read, um, count, um, for very comprehensive and thorough whatever. I, I would add to the end, um, the SBE also supports school administrators working collaboratively with teachers and their elected representatives in deciding which evaluation to use, uh, implementing it effectively and fairly, and providing peer review in the evaluation process. So the idea is that to um, ensure that it's a collaborative process where teachers um, uh, are are part of this and included in the conversation. I think it'll make it a more effective tool in the end. Can you repeat the sentence? Uh, is, it, is it we encourage or we support? Uh, I am, uh, SBE also supports mm -hmm. school administrators working collaboratively with teachers and their elected representatives in deciding which evaluation tool to use, implementing it effectively and fairly, and providing peer review in the evaluation process. Would, would just a thought, would you want to say administrators and local boards? Because the boards I, will I, often I, have yeah, the I say on, local boards. on which instrument they're choosing local to boards. use. Yeah. That's school boards oh, and just and administrators and teachers. Yeah. Okay. The spirit behind what you're saying. School right, boards and right. teachers, yeah. Okay. We we're encouraging them all to work collaboratively in picking out a yeah. RC. Right. Which right. I think is and it would be done at a board meeting we typically. Say encourages instead of supports, is that what you're saying? The, the only thing I, I would point out, that, that maybe there's two separate things here. Maybe there's a press release that talks about how we would like to see this fleshed out, but that this that document it, it pertains to the educator um, uh, the educator effectiveness um, report and I, I I'm not sure I think what there's a message here to the legislature and then I think there's a message to the world and I, I believe that Michelle's is a message to the world I don't know that we want to get into that don't we just want to convince the legislature that they need to do this they need to do it well and that they it would be good if they did it fast but to me, it's about three paragraphs, and then there's a, a broader statement to everybody else saying not only should they do it, but there are other components that would make it strong and, and work very well. Well, if, if we, I see what you're saying, but if that were the case, wouldn't we then remove the, this, the paragraph on the colleges of education? That's, that, I, I'm fine going there. I, okay. I, 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 I'm worried that this is going to be so long that it won't be effective for the legislature. So, um, or maybe it's bullet points. We've done this before when we've tried to tighten things up, knowing that our intended reader may just go, sorry, that microphone didn't pick that up, but <laughs> 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 so what? Um, so I just want it punchy, and I want us saying to them, this is good work. Uh, we believe it's effective for the field. And then the larger message of uh, if this is done right, it would be extremely successful. There are other additional components that we know of that the educator effectiveness report does not list. But they're not going to incorporate that in the legislation, I don't think. If that's the goal, if you want to enumerate things that you want them to put in legislation, then that's a different story. Okay. I think it's more of a, you know, uh, it doesn't seem like, you know, we want you to pass this law and here's the verbiage of, of the law. I think the way I saw this, and maybe I'm wrong because I wasn't on the committee, was the message goes out to the legislature, but it also is going to be used and seen as coming from the board as a directive either to the department or as to um, the education community in the state through that. And um, I really think it's so integral 
to the evaluation process to have peer have a, a sentiment of peer review in there um, and also to get the buy-in I mean there's a lot of skepticism to me with regard to teachers sort of feeling locked out of the process um, and I think having buy-in will make it more effective I think it's worth including because I do think it maybe they won't you know pass specific legislation on it but I think it's an important enough factor that it, it shouldn't just be on a press release I think it's really critical to being an effective tool and uh, having it actually have buy-in and at the local level and not just seen as a um, sort of a top-down um, thing so I and I have buy-in from all the key people uh, at a local level I, I so I guess the technical question is is that a friendly amendment or whatever to the mover and mm -hmm. shaker it, it is and, and then we yeah please I, I appreciate your point Eileen but I think this is a statement of both support encouragement the legislature and kind of our perspective on the um, the report and its recommendations and a bit of exhortation there about how we hope it will be applied so I don't think it adds too much um, uh, length or uh, or um, distraction so I, I would support us uh, adding that sentence and the other amendments and uh, hope we would all support this. Richard? I don't object to the uh, adding that sentence, but it seems to me it might go with the fourth paragraph on implementation rather than the second paragraph, which essentially commends the report itself. I think that's a good point. Okay. And that might get closer to yeah, kind of Eileen's actually. point also. Yeah, that sounds okay. good. But it's after. Solomon over here. Well, the Monopoly King, anyway. Well. There you go. Um, then I, I would just wordsmith it in the second paragraph. It should say it emphasizes that effective evaluations strengthen and improve teacher and administrative practice to improve student learning. It, it goes on from there. Yeah, it's just these are small things. It, um, uh, it, um, it's it's fine. It's just a little wordy, and I'm just trying to. Um, anyway, it emphasizes that effective evaluations strengthen and improve teacher and administrative practices to improve student learning. Okay, so take out the are done. Yeah, they're just they're just it's just small okay. things. Yeah. That's better. And then you could do it in the, the, for these goals to be reached instead of in order for it. And the only reason I'm doing it is I'm just trying to make it punchier. Yeah. So, which, which you know, in the next paragraph. paragraph, the report calls for systemic change for schools for these goals to be reached. Okay. Training those charged with uh, performing evaluations is absolutely essential. So is everyone okay, or the mover and shaker with the punchier? <laughs> Version. Punchy, punchy. Yeah. Okay. Can can any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, great statement. And timely. Mm -hmm. And let's see. So the next one is the discussion on school closure policy, and this is very quick. Um, just last month, um, when we were having our conversations, Dan had a couple of recommendations uh, after we had heard from. <laughs> many uh, concerned parents about the closure of Oakman School and these were more um, discussions in general of uh, suggestions that we as a State Board of Education would have if we were to um, develop a model policy for um, the closure of a school and we discussed these at the legislative committee meeting and decided that rather than just take the few ideas that came out as a result of that meeting what we really should consider doing is actually developing a model policy from the State Board of Education outlining the things that we would suggest if a school district were considering the closure of a school such as you know there should be a public comment period there you know these types of things and so we as the legislative committee are willing to put something together but we want to um, solicit ideas from all of the board members before we do that so that everyone has an opportunity to share with us what you think Mm -hmm. uh, a closure would look like this would be you know a non-binding it's not something we can force on districts but it would certainly be something that we as a state board of education would say these would be our 
minimum recommendations if you were to look at doing something like this. So I am just throwing it out there that, you know, we don't even need to necessarily discuss it right now at the board table, but if you have ideas, if you could send them to either myself or one of the other members of the legislative committee, and then at the next meeting we can start compiling these and come up with a, a, a draft statement. Excellent. <laughs> good. Great report. The Barner Protocol. Good. <laughs> so are we good? I have one more yes, thing. Um, the next legislative committee meeting actually coincides with um, a statewide meeting um, being held on, I believe, school finance. 16th. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. So those of us on the legislative committee might want to consider changing the date of that meeting because I know Kathleen wants to be there. I think Lupe, did you want to be there as well? So um, it's the just, deficit. Um, yes. Right. And well, the, 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 the conference that the department is co-sponsoring with MASB yeah. and the rest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So um, maybe Mertz, if you could send out an email so we can reschedule that meeting. Yep. Thank you. And that would be great. Thank you for those that could make that. I think it shows, it's as much showing the flag that this is an important issue and we're trying to get ahead of it and help districts get ahead of it so they don't end up in the process that is overwhelming us here in the department. So, well, great. I think, and we did the comments. Uh, next meeting is October 8th. I think we're done and we did it on time, really. Hey. So, <laughs> before time. Yeah. Hey.